In the back pages of the world of ice and fire, and I mean the very back pages, there's a curious tale of an ancient kingdom from the far east called the Great Empire of the Dawn. It reads very like a Song of Ice and Fire's own Atlantis legend. It was a fabled society of immense wealth, knowledge, and power, and of course hubris, and it met a sudden end in a world-shaping cataclysm. While it seems like just a bit of extra world building with a few Lovecraft references thrown in, the Great Empire of the Dawn story is actually nothing less than the story of the long lost people who built a shy by the shadow. The people who likely tamed dragons before the Valerians did. Well, that's pretty exciting all on its own, right? The origins of dragons and dragonlord magic is just the sort of delightful mystery that all fantasy fans are drawn to. But the Great Empire of the Dawn theory is more than that, much more, because there is virtually irrefutable proof that these ancient pre-Valerian dragonlords actually came to Westeros in ancient days. That's right. This is definitely the most relevant part of the theory for the main story, because I believe that it helps solve some of the most perplexing puzzles of A Song of Ice and Fire, such as why House Dane has a mysterious, highly anachronistic, 10,000-year-old, unbreakable magic sword, and a tendency to manifest Valerian looks from time to time. Why the legend of Azor Ahai, an ancient myth from the Far East, is important to a story that is clearly primarily about Westeros. Why the last hero's final White Walker slaying sword was said to be made from dragon steel, and why Targaryens are needed at the wall to face the others. The Great Empire of the Dawn theory also sheds light on a few of the more obscure mysteries in A Song of Ice and Fire, such as the potential non-Westerosi origins of the first Hightowers, Ironborn, Danes, and perhaps even Lannisters, why there are legends of dragons and dragon slayers in ancient Westeros, and who may have built some of those mysteriously advanced structures around Westeros like Storm's End, Moat Caelan, and even the Wall. But first, we have to figure out just what is going on over in the Far East with this fabled Great Empire of the Dawn. Hey there, friends and fellow Mythheads, it's Lucifer Means Lightbringer, and I'm here with a newly polished version of one of my very oldest theories. That's right, although there have been many good videos and essays on the Great Empire of the Dawn, including the collaboration History of Westeros and I did a couple years back, which most of you are probably familiar with, my essay outlining this theory on the westeros.org forums from April 2nd, 2015, is, to the best of my knowledge, the first appearance of this theory. I know, I know, no one cares, but thank you for allowing me my brief moment of nostalgia and flag planting. With the crucial help of my brilliant friend Duran Durandon, I came up with this theory right after my main long night moon meteors theory, and it's always been a favorite topic of mine. It's kind of like finding a secret Numenor in the history of A Song of Ice and Fire, and it's actually ancient to shy, so that's pretty damn fun. Anyway, this video is brought to you by my wonderful Patreon community and all the Mythheads who like, share, and comment on my videos, so a big thanks to all of you. In late 2014, George R. R. Martin, along with co-writers Elio Garcia and Linda Antonson, who run Westeros.org, released a vast and delightful treasure box masquerading as a coffee-style world book companion, being also known by the name The World of Ice and Fire. It dropped into the Westeros.org forums like bloody chum into shark-infested waters. Old friends like Ravenous Reader and Durn Durndon remember the feeding frenzy of theorizing that went down at the time. All the stuff from the Far East stood out right away, especially this strange story of a fabled lost empire whose ending involved both the Long Night and our old friend Azor Ahai. We find it in the history of Yi Ti, although the Great Empire of the Dawn is actually a predecessor. In the beginning, the priestly scribes of Yin declare, all the land between the bones and the freezing desert called the Grey Waste, from the Shivering Sea to the Jade Sea, including even the great and holy Isle of Lang, formed a single realm ruled by the God on Earth, the only begotten son of the Lion of Night and the Maiden Maid of Light, who traveled about his domains in a palanquin carved from a single pearl and carried by a hundred queens, his wives. For 10,000 years, the great empire of the dawn flourished in peace and plenty under the god on earth, until at last he ascended to the stars to join his forebears. Dominion over mankind then passed to his eldest son, who was known as the Pearl Emperor and ruled for a thousand years. The Jade Emperor, the Tourmaline Emperor, the Onyx Emperor, the Topaz Emperor, and the Opal Emperor followed in turn, each reigning for centuries. Yet every reign was shorter and more troubled than the one preceding it, for wild men and baleful beasts pressed at the borders of the Great Empire. Lesser kings grew prideful and rebellious, and the common people gave themselves over to avarice, envy, 
lust, murder, incest, gluttony, and sloth. Breaking in here for a moment, we can see that so far this is a very standard tale of a high civilization which eventually grows corrupt and prideful before its great downfall. Again, think of Atlantis, or Numenor from The Lord of the Rings. The god-emperors of the Great Empire of the Dawn apparently started out with some sort of divine mandate, but then lost their way. Let's see what happens next! When the daughter of the Opal Emperor succeeded him as the Amethyst Empress, her envious younger brother cast her down and slew her, proclaiming himself the Bloodstone Emperor and beginning a reign of terror. He practiced dark arts, torture, and necromancy, enslaved his people, took a tiger woman for his bride, feasted on human flesh, and cast down the true gods to worship a black stone that had fallen from the sky. Many scholars count the Bloodstone Emperor as the first high priest of the sinister Church of Starry Wisdom, which persists to this day in many port cities throughout the known world. In the annals of the further east, it was the Blood Betrayal, as his usurpation is named, that ushered in the Age of Darkness called the Long Night. Despairing of the evil that had been unleashed on Earth, the Maiden Maid of Light turned her back upon the world, and the Lion of Night came forth in all his wrath to punish the wickedness of men. How long the darkness endured, no man can say, but all agree that it was only when a great warrior, known variously as Hirkun the Hero, Azor Ahai, Yin Tar, Nefarian, and Eldric Shadow Chaser, arose to give courage to the race of men and lead the virtuous into battle with his blazing sword Lightbringer that the darkness was put to rout, and light and love returned once more to the world. All right, well, that certainly went south. Torture, necromancy, meteor worship, an age of darkness so full of evil the gods themselves despair. This is the eastern version of the Long Night story, and I can definitely picture Old Nan telling this one to Bran one dark and stormy night. Dark arts, torture, and necromancy. Is this the sort of story you like, boy? So the place to start with this myth is the presence of the Long Night, despite the fact that Tiger Woman sounds pretty damn cool. And that's probably a reference to the god Empress of Lang, actually, as it is known as the Land of Ten Thousand Tigers. As you can see from this very legend, the Long Night was a global cataclysm, felt from Westeros all the way to Yi Ti, and thus it acts as a universal line of demarcation throughout world history. If the Great Empire of the Dawn ended with a Long Night, then it must have existed before, during the Dawn Age, appropriately enough. The Azor Ahai myth is always attached to the Long Night, and he pops up in this story too, so all of that agrees chronologically, as much as it can for history this old. Yiti itself is regarded as one of the very first civilizations to arise in the wake of the Long Night, and although they consider themselves descendants of the Great Empire, and in a certain sense heirs of the Great Empire as they use that God-Emperor title still, we can be sure that there is a significant break between the two civilizations because of the next paragraph in that World of Ice and Fire passage that we were just quoting from. Yet the great empire of the dawn was not reborn, for the restored world was a broken place where every tribe of men went his own way, fearful of all the others, and war and lust and murder endured even to our present day. Or so the men and women of the further east believe. So Yi Ti arose some time after the chaos and strife of the Great Empire's collapse, controlling a large part, but not all, of their former territory. The Yitish scribes preserve the memory of this older empire in their most ancient histories. The Yitish, along with the Ashai, are said to have been the world's first record keepers for what it's worth, but considers the Great Empire to have ended with a long night. The plot thickens quite a bit, like molten magma hardening into stone, when we read about one of the great achievements of the Great Empire of the Dawn, known as the Five Forts. One note, the quote, Golden Empire that you're about to hear referred to in this next passage is Yi Ti, whose full name is the Golden Empire of Yi Ti, not to be confused with the Great Empire of the Dawn. Titles, titles. No discussion of Yi Ti would be complete without a mention of the Five Forts, a line of hulking ancient citadels that stand along the far northeastern frontiers of the Golden Empire, between the Bleeding Sea, named for the characteristic hue of its deep waters, supposedly a result of a plant that grows only there, and the Mountains of the Morn. The Five Forts are very old, older than the Golden Empire itself. Some claim they were raised by the Pearl Emperor during the mourning of the Great Empire to keep the Lion of Night and his demons from the realms of men. 
And indeed, there is something godlike or demonic about the monstrous size of the forts, for each of the five is large enough to house 10,000 men, and their massive walls stand almost a thousand feet high. We can't be sure if the five forts were actually built by the quote-unquote Pearl Emperor, or if there even was one specific person called the Pearl Emperor, but it is certain that the forts must predate Yi Ti for reasons of simple logic. Yi Ti has kept unbroken records since the beginning of their empire, and they would definitely know if they had undertaken the massive, massive civic works project that would have been needed to build these hulking citadels with walls hundreds of feet high. They would be eager to take credit for them, so the fact that they did not also tells us that Yi Ti did not build the Five Forts. Now, the reason why it's so important to date the Five Forts is because they seem to have been built by Dragonlords. Certain scholars from the West have suggested Valyrian involvement in the construction of the Five Forts. For the Great Walls are single slabs of fused black stone that resemble certain Valyrian citadels in the West. But this seems unlikely, for the forts predate the Freehold's rise, and there is no record of any Dragonlords ever coming so far east. Thus, the five forts must remain a mystery. They still stand today, unmarked by time, guarding the marches of the Golden Empire against raiders out of the Grey Waste. Fused stone, as far as we know, can only be created with dragon fire to melt the stone, and sorcery, both to control the dragons and then to shape and harden the stone in place. That's why the maesters say that the five forts seem like Valerian work. However, they also rightly point out that Valeria arose after the Long Night and was never known to have come this far east. And so they can only shrug their shoulders. What they don't come right out and say is that we essentially have a case of a missing pre-Long Night Dragonlord civilization in the Far East. Which is kind of interesting, I don't know. Could that civilization be the Great Empire of the Dawn? Well, certainly I wondered if that might be the case when I read this passage about the Five Forts. But we've been getting clues about dragons having first originated somewhere else in the Far East before Valeria existed for a long time now, ever since Book One. That would be a shy, of course. For example, in Bran's coma dream in A Game of Thrones, he looks east to the lands of Ashai, quote, where dragons stirred beneath the sunrise. And in that same book, Daenerys had heard that the first dragons had come from the east, from the shadowlands beyond Ashai and the islands of the Jade Sea, and thinks to herself that perhaps some were still living there in realms strange and wild. Danny's dragon eggs are said to come from Ashai, and even if Illyria was lying about that, it shows that Ashai is a place where people expect dragon's eggs to come from. Danny is, of course, not the only one who has heard those stories about an Ashai origin for dragons. The highly reputable Septon Barth also refers to that same story in his seminal work entitled Dragons, Worms, and Wyverns, Their Unnatural History. In such fragments of Barth's unnatural history as remain, the Septon appears to have considered various legends examining the origins of dragons and how they came to be controlled by the Valerians. In Ashai, the tales are many and confused, but certain texts, all impossibly ancient, claim that dragons first came from the shadow, a place where all our learning fails us. These Ashai histories say that a people so ancient they had no name first tamed dragons in the shadow and brought them to Valyria, teaching the Valyrians their arts before departing from the annals. Yet if men in the shadow had tamed dragons first, why did they not conquer as the Valyrians did? Perhaps these men in the shadow of Ashai did use dragons to conquer as the Valyrians did. Their empire was called the Great Empire of the Dawn, and it was indeed quite large. Think about it. The five forts are said to have been built by the Great Empire of the Dawn, but the few stone building technique used there requires the presence of dragonlords. Ashai is thought by some to be the place where dragons first came from. So, if the ancient Ashai and the nation known as the Great Empire of the Dawn are one and the same, this all fits together very nicely. It's just that it's 10,000-year-old history which has passed through the cultural bottleneck of the Long Night, and so the information that we have is very fragmented. This is where Durin Durandin's key find comes in. All right, so dragons may have first come from Ashai, and if the Great Empire of the Dawn did indeed build the Five Forts, then they must have counted dragon lords amongst their people. You got that. There is a good logistical case for Ashai having been built by the Great Empire of the Dawn, and I'll make that in just a second. But there's actually a huge flaming sword in the darkness level clue about the Great Empire people having been dragonlords 
that comes all the way back in a Game of Thrones. And this is the thing that my friend Dern Durandon found. This passage comes at the very end of Danny's Wake the Dragon dream that she has while lying unconscious in Miri Mazdor's Tent of Dancing Shadows. Want to wake the dragon? Ghosts lined the hallway, dressed in the faded raiment of kings. In their hands were swords of pale fire. They had hair of silver and hair of gold and hair of platinum white, and their eyes were opal and amethyst, tourmaline and jade. Faster, they cried, faster, faster. She raced, her feet melting the stone wherever they touched. Faster, the ghosts cried as one, and she screamed and threw herself forward. A great knife of pain ripped down her back, and she felt her skin tear open and smelled the stench of burning blood and saw the shadow of wings. And Daenerys Targaryen flew. Wake. Hair of silver and gold and platinum white mark these people as Valerians, or at least as Blood of the Dragon people. And most readers have always assumed these kingly ghosts to be Danny's Valerian ancestors. I do think they are Danny's ancestors, and the one with amethyst eyes does indeed look like a model Valerian, but the rest do not. However, opal, amethyst, tourmaline, and jade are no random grouping of four gemstones. Those are four of the eight gemstones attributed to the rulers of the Great Empire of the Dawn which, as you recall, were pearl, jade, tourmaline, onyx, topaz, opal, amethyst, and bloodstone. Now, I don't necessarily think that George had the details of the Great Empire of the Dawn planned out when he wrote A Game of Thrones. However, we can tell from the clues about dragons and Ashai that he left in A Game of Thrones that he definitely did have a general idea about there being some lost pre-Valerian dragonlord people from Ashai. All this stuff about the Great Empire of the Dawn in the World of Ice and Fire it's basically just George filling out those details. Or, said in the parlance of Gardner-style writers like George, he's watering the seeds of world-building that he planted in Book 1. And when he did, he chose those same four gemstones that he had used in the eyes of Danny's ghostly ancestors as four of the eight gemstones that represent the rulers of the Great Empire to give us a clue that we should link them together. Therefore, we can be relatively certain that George is now thinking of these gemstone-eyed kingly ghosts with dragonlord hair as Great Empire of the Dawn people. They look like dragon lords, they tell Danny to wake the dragon, and in their hands are swords of pale fire. That's certainly interesting, since the one flaming sword we hear of, Lightbringer, was supposedly used to defeat the armies of darkness during the Long Night, right after the collapse of the Great Empire. If the Great Empire people were dragon lords, then it's possible that flaming sword technology was something that they had as well. But the main point here is more of a literary one. In A Song of Ice and Fire, we associate flaming swords with Lightbringer, which is a part of the Great Empire of the Dawn story, and with Azor Ahai, whose myth comes from Ashai. Lightbringer and Azor Ahai are in turn strongly linked to dragons, and here in Danny's dream, she sees the gemstone people as dragon lords, holding Lightbringer swords, who cheer her on to wake the dragon. So again, you can see how all these details fit together very nicely if the Great Empire of the Dawn was a civilization of dragon lords who created a vast empire before the Long Night, one that included Ashai, the place where dragons seemed to come from. Their empire ended in disaster, and certainly Ashai looks like it was the epicenter of a huge magical disaster of some kind in the ancient past, something on the scale of the doom of Valeria or even worse. And here, one has to think of the black meteor that the Bloodstone Emperor worshipped when the long night fell, the shining trapezite. Oh, anyways. Flaming swords seem to have been a part of their magical arsenal, hence the many tales of a hero fighting the darkness with Lightbringer at the sunset of their kingdom. The apparent fact that Danny is seeing the ghosts of the kings and emperors who rule the Great Empire as dragon lords with flaming swords, right at the climax of her Wake the Dragon dream, speaks to their importance. If these folks don't know something about what it means for Danny to be Azor or High Reborn, I don't know who does. It seems obvious that if these are the Gemstone Emperor ghosts, then the one with Amethyst eyes probably indicates that the Valerians directly descend from the people of the Great Empire, as opposed to the scenario that Septon Barth imagines where men from Ashai simply taught the first Valerians their arts before disappearing from the pages of history. These kingly ghosts are Danny's direct ancestors, her most ancient blood, and these are the people who first bonded with dragons, who in all likelihood first created the blood of the dragon. When Danny gets her hands on that glass candle that Marwyn the Mage is almost certainly bringing to Slaver's Bay, I suspect that these gemstone-eyed folks may put in another appearance. 
One wonders about the truth that Quave keeps saying waits for Danny in a shy. We've always imagined that it had something to do with Azor High and Dragonlord stuff, and now we can connect that idea to these kingly ghosts with their Dragonlord hair and their flaming swords who were contacting Danny in her all-important Wake the Dragon dream. They may well have ruled their great empire from a shy, as we're about to see. All right, now I want to make the more practically-minded folks in the audience happy. You all know I love the symbolism and the literary clues like the gemstone thing, but figuring out that Ashai was part of the Great Empire of the Dawn can be achieved through logic as well. Oh, it's going to be so satisfying. First, let's talk about the territory said to be included inside the Great Empire of the Dawn, which is somewhat loosely described as all the land between the bones and the freezing desert called the Grey Waste, from the Shivering Sea to the Jade Sea, including even the Great and Holy Isle of Lang. As you can see on the map, that description could arguably include Ashai. If the Great Empire conquered Lang, that means they were a maritime power, and Ashai would have been well within their reach. Ashai can also be reached over land by caravan even to this day, as we hear from Mirimaz Dor in A Game of Thrones. So it's actually kind of difficult to imagine a huge, powerful kingdom like the Great Empire existing right next to Ashai, but not including it. Another clue about this comes from following the linguistic path of the Azor Ahai legend. We are told that this flaming sword hero appears in at least five forms. Hirakun the hero, Azor Ahai, Yin Tar, Nefarion, and Eldric Shadow Chaser. And three of those names are easily traceable to lands within the former borders of the Great Empire. Hirakun the hero comes from Hirakun, a now vanished empire which existed within the lands of the Great Empire. Yin Tar is obviously from Yi Ti, whose lands were also a part of the Great Empire. And the same is also true of the city of Nefer, chief city of the people called the Nagai, presumably the place where Neferion comes from. This all makes sense because these kingdoms would all have sprung up in the wake of the Great Empire's downfall, preserving their own memory of the flaming sword hero who ended the Long Night, but changing the name and probably other details of the story over time to match their specific culture, as happens in the real world with the evolution of myth and history. The name Azor Ahai fits this pattern as well, it comes from the Ashai version of the story, and the word Azor Ahai is phonetically similar to the word Ashai, as Yin Tar is to Yi Ti. So, perhaps Ashai was part of the Great Empire, as the ancestors of the people of Hirkun, Yi Ti, and Nefer were. In fact, I can't help but notice that that AI suffix of Azor Ahai and Ashai can also be found all through the lands that were once part of the Great Empire. The Nagai, people of Nefer, the Jogos Nai, the city of Stigai, upriver from Ashai, and the nearby volcanic island of Marahai. The Eldric Shadow Chaser name is a total wild card, a total freak, matching nothing in Essos, although we do find Eldric name variants in, oh, let's see, checks notes, House Stark and House Dane. Yes, and you better believe that that is a clue we'll follow up on when we talk about the Westerosi side of things in part two. But for now, it's sufficient to observe that peoples formerly part of the Great Empire all seem to retain a version of the Flaming Sword hero myth and Ashai has that myth as well. The better evidence that Ashai is part of the Great Empire comes from looking at Ashai itself, a freaky place that it is. Today, Ashai is heavily depopulated and is inhabited mostly by various types of mages and sorcerers who have come to study the dark arts. Easternmost and southernmost of the great cities of the known world, the ancient port of Ashai stands at the end of a long wedge of land on the point where the Jade Sea meets the Saffron Straits. Its origins are lost in the mists of time. Even the Ashai do not claim to know who built their city. They will say only that a city has stood here since the world began, and will stand here until it ends. Ashai is a large city, sprawling out for leagues on both banks of the Black River Ash. Behind its enormous land walls is ground enough for Volantis, Karth, and King's Landing to stand side by side and still have enough room for Old Town. Yet the population of Ashai is no greater than that of a good-sized market town. By night, the streets are deserted, and only one building in ten shows a light. Ashai by the Shadow is not just a large city. It's the largest city in the known world, and it's not close. Volantis, Karth, Old Town, and King's Landing are among the very largest cities that we know of in current times, and Ashai is bigger than all of them put together. That's huge. Enormous gargantuan, nothing less than a Dawn Age metropolis. The exact details of the glory and height of the Great Empire may be shrouded in myth, but the raw size of Ashai is undeniable. 
To put it simply, huge cities are built by huge empires. Large urban populations have to be supported by farmlands outside the city, and the wealth and manpower needed to build a large city always come from a large, thriving population. It's pretty obvious that Ashai did not need to be so big if its original purpose was as a super-evil Hogwarts for Shadowbinders and Dark Mages. That's just the way it's used now. And what about those enormous land walls that surround the city? They're totally unnecessary now, but would have made a lot of sense in a time when Ashai was fully populated. The question that arises at this point concerns the state of Ashai. The Shadowlands Peninsula on which it sits, and the very city itself, seem magically blighted in a significant way. It's said that animals and children don't survive long there. It's not the type of place a large civilization would thrive. But was it always like this? Few places in the known world are as remote as Ashai, and fewer are as forbidding. Travelers tell us that the city is built entirely of black stone. Halls, hovels, temples, palaces, streets, walls, bazaars, all. Some say as well that the Stone of Ashai has a greasy, unpleasant feel to it, that it seems to drink the light, dimming tapers and torches and hearth fires alike. The nights are very black in Ashai, all agree, and even the brightest days of summer are somehow gray and gloomy. It seems clear to me that something happened here. It really feels a lot like the doom of Valeria, which has left the lands of the long summer blighted and cursed and toxic some 400 years later. Whatever happened at Ashai would have happened 8,000 years ago or whenever the long night occurred, so it's had longer to cool off, if you will. But the point is, when we see this sort of magical darkness lingering in one place and making the stone sick and evil, this isn't a natural occurrence, you know? Something is causing this. It's not just the stone and the dark skies either, but the land around the city as well. Despite its forbidding aspects, Ashai by the Shadow has for many centuries been a thriving port where ships from all over the known world come to trade, crossing vast and stormy seas. Most arrive laden with foodstuffs and wine, for beyond the walls of Ashai little grows safe ghost grass, whose glassy growing stalks are inedible. If not for the food brought in from across the sea, the Ashai would have starved. The ships bring casks of fresh water, too. The waters of the ash glisten black beneath the noonday sun and glimmer with a pale green phosphorescence by night. And such fish as swim in the river are blind and twisted, so deformed and hideous to look upon that only fools and shadowbinders will eat of their flesh. Every land beneath the sun has needs of fruits and grains and vegetables, so one might ask why any mariner would sail to the ends of the earth when he might more easily sell his cargo to markets closer to home. The answer is gold. Beyond the walls of Ashai, food is scarce, but gold and gems are common. Though some will say that the gold of the Shadowlands is as unhealthy in its own way as the fruits that grow there. The ships come nonetheless, for gold, for gems, and for other treasures, for certain things spoken of only in whispers, things that cannot be found anywhere upon the earth save in the black bazaars of Ashai. So, almost nothing grows near Ashai save for the ghost grass, which is why the city requires food to be brought in by ship. This works well enough for the very small population of wizards that live there now, but if the city were full, it could not subsist solely on trade. I mean, you just don't build an ancient metropolis in a blighted land with no food. Additionally, there is a passage which tells us that there are no children or animals in Ashai, presumably because they just do not last long in such a toxic environment. That, too, would seem to be a problem for creating a Dawn Age metropolis. You can't have any children or animals. Okay, yes, no, that's not going to work. All of this points to an ancient Ashai and Shadowlands Peninsula, which were not blighted and shadowed once upon a time. Without the magical shadow and the toxic pall that infects the land there, Ashai might have once been a prosperous city on the tip of a verdant peninsula, guarding a valuable trade route, the Saffron Straits, with lots of gold and gems to be found in the hills. Now that sounds more like the recipe for a Dawn Age metropolis, a city bigger than any created since. But again, it would require Ashai to also control massive amounts of land beyond their city, which runs them right up against the Great Empire of the Dawn. So let's think about this. Ashai must have been a large, prosperous city at one point before the Long Night, one that controlled great territory. And the Great Empire of the Dawn, was a large, prosperous empire that existed in roughly the same place and time. The easiest explanation is that Ashai was not only part of the Great Empire, but its capital. The largest and greatest empire that existed before the Long Night. 
built the largest and greatest city that existed before the long night. <laughs> Makes sense, right? What other explanation is there for a city so ridiculously damn large? The Great Empire and Ashai being one and the same also explains the existence of the fused stone found at the Five Forts. And it also explains Danny's dream of Valerian-looking kingly ghosts with gemstone eyes that match the rulers of the Great Empire. The Great Empire built in fused stone and appeared to Danny as Lightbringer-wielding dragon lords because they were Lightbringer-wielding dragon lords. Speaking of strange stone, that's actually the title of a Maester's book about the fused stone and the greasy black stone. Let's talk about that greasy black stone that Ashai is built from in more detail. The greasy black stone is different from fused stone, which is also black. Fused stone is made by dragon lords with dragonfire and sorcery, does not seem to be cursed, and is found in places like Valyria, Dragonstone, Volantis, and on the Valerian roads which span much of Essos. Black stone which is greasy or oily and which drinks the light is a specific creepy substance which George has scattered around the world in a few places in addition to a shy. We find it for sure at the ancient jungle city of Yin in Sothorios, on Toad Isle in the Basilisk Isles, and in the form of the sea stone chair on the Iron Islands. And then there's also the black basalt blocks of Moat Kalin, which may also be oily black stone based on an unclear quote in A Dance with Dragons, although that's not really relevant right now. Check out this quote from the World of Ice and Fire about Yi. Maesters and other scholars alike have puzzled over the greatest enigmas of Sothorios, the ancient city of Yi, a ruin older than time, built of oily black stone in massive blocks so heavy that it would require a dozen elephants to move them. Yi has remained a desolation for many thousands of years, yet the jungle that surrounds it on every side has scarce touched it. A city so evil that even the jungle will not enter. Nymeria is supposed to have said when she laid eyes on it if the tales are true. Every attempt to rebuild or resettle Yin has ended in horror. Sorry, that quote was just so evil I had to call Quinn in as the pinch hitter narrator for this one. Thank you, Quinn. Anyway, this sounds a lot like the oily black stone at Ashai. Plants won't grow near it. It reeks of evil and sorcery, and it's so old no one knows its origins. My point isn't to solve the mystery of Yin, but to demonstrate that the oily black stone substance is associated with curses and evil magic at Yin and Ashai. Toad Isle may be cursed as well, and the same goes for the sea stone chair, in my opinion. Now, when we consider that Ashai, a city bigger than anything the world has produced since, is made entirely out of this freak nasty oily black stone, we're left with two possibilities. Either it was built out of cursed stone to begin with, or it was built out of something else, out of regular stone, or maybe fused stone, and then later cursed and blighted. The second option makes far more sense. A large thriving population probably wouldn't build its wealthy capital out of evil cursed stone, I'm thinking. And as we said, a large population would have a very hard time existing there with the land being so cursed, so the logical answer is that the land and the stone of the city were cursed and blighted in the same incident, likely during the calamity known as the Long Night. Think back to the Bloodstone Emperor, the ruler of the Great Empire of the Dawn, who was remembered as having brought on their downfall and the Long Night itself through dark magic and murder. Doesn't that all fit with the state of Ashai now? Ashai and the surrounding lands may have been blighted with dark magic during the Long Night, and the guy who is thought of to be responsible for the Long Night is famous for practicing dark magic. I mean, can't you picture this guy at Stigai working his spells? I sure can. And the best part is that the Bloodstone Emperor worshipped a black meteorite that fell from the sky. And as we all know for an absolute indisputable fact, the darkness of the Long Night was caused by the smoke, ash, and debris thrown up from an ancient meteor strike. Well, that's not a fact, that's actually just my theory. But it would certainly explain things. And one notes that comets and meteors are referred to as bleeding stars in A Song of Ice and Fire. So a meteorite could be thought of as a bloodstone. The bloodstone emperor who brought on the long night and worshipped the evil black rock that caused it. Sounds plausible, right? Now, whether or not you like my meteor theory as an explanation for the desolation around the Shadowlands and Ashai, I still think it's an inescapable conclusion that it's far more likely that Ashai was built out of regular stone, or fused stone, and then later cursed, rather than having been built from cursed stone to begin with. Otherwise, we have to picture a huge city populated entirely by squishers who eat nothing but ghost grass and stolen human babies for food. And I just don't think that's the explanation that Martin is hinting at here. 
But please do comment below with your Squisher Empire of the Dawn fanfic. I'm here for that if I'm here for anything. Instead, I think we can simply picture Ashai as the once glorious capital of the long lost Dragonlord Empire, also known as the Great Empire of the Dawn. Azor Ahai, Lightbringer, the origins of the Long Night, the magical art of dragon riding, all of it started here. To go north, you must journey south. To reach the west, you must go east. To go forward, you must go back. And to touch the light, you must pass beneath the shadow. A shy, Danny thought. She would have me go to a shy. Will the Ashai give me an army? She demanded. Will there be gold for me in a shy? Will there be ships? What is there in a shy that I have not found in Karth? Truth, said the woman in the mask. And bowing, she faded back into the crowd. All right, now that we've glimpsed a little bit of that hidden truth of Ashai, we're ready to go to Westeros in part two, because we have an equally mysterious, pretty long night, few stone construction over there, as we found in the Five Forts. And if you think about it, that's really no surprise. Of course all this Azor High stuff has to connect to Westeros, right? Why else would there be so much about Jon and Daenerys fulfilling the prophesied rebirth of a hero from Ashai if the original hadn't come to Westeros? I mean, everyone's always wondered if Azor High is connected to the Westerosi myth of the last hero ending the long night with the Sword of Dragonsteel, or perhaps to House Dane and the Sword Dawn. But for any of that to work, we need some sort of plausible connection between pre-Long Night Westeros and pre-Long Night Ashai. And in part two, I will show you where it is and what it means. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. Please leave a comment and a like on your way out. Make sure you breathe some fire on the notification bell rawr, next to the subscription button. And most of all, thanks to all of our patrons. I need you to record.